Hey everybody, good morning. Good morning. Right, welcome everybody. It, uh, it's Memorial Day weekend. Happy Memorial Day weekend. It's great to have you here today. Uh, because Memorial Day weekend is the unofficial start of summer, I have just a few, ex I know we've thrown a lot of information at you this morning already, but I have a, uh, at least a couple of extended headlines, things you have to know before you leave today. So we've been teaching through the book, uh, a New Testament book called Hebrews for, uh, I don't know, a while, right? <laughs> it's, uh, starting next week, we just want to let you know uh, that in the, for four weeks in the month of June, we're going to take a break from the book of Hebrews, okay? And we're actually, we'll come back to Hebrews in July. Did everybody hear me say that? We're coming back to Hebrews in July. But we just want to let you know that beginning next week, we're taking four weeks uh, to begin a new teaching series called I Am Not Myself. I Am Not Myself is a series about sexual identity, gender identity, transgenderism, and what it means to be the church at this particular cultural moment. Uh, we've been eager to get to this series for a long time. It's been on our minds for a long time. It's been on the calendar for a long time. And I just want to invite you to pray for this series. If I need to explain to you why you should pray for this series, I don't know where you live. <laughs> but please uh, join me in praying for our teaching uh, in the month of June. Christopher West says, if we want to know what is most sacred in the world, all we need to do is look for what is most violently profaned. And there are few things being more violently profaned and creating more heartache and creating more confusion right now than those things. So uh, I think that's because they get at the heart of what a person is and Jesus has something to say about every one of these things. Okay, despite what you may have heard, Jesus absolutely has something to say about sexual identity, gender identity, and transgenderism, and everything that he says is good news. Uh, so I'm going to invite you to pray for us, especially for Porter and I, since we'll be doing all the teaching in that series. Um, I just want to add for parents with small children, I think this will be a PG-13 series. Uh, it's not written yet, you know, I, I, but I'm not planning to be graphic. We're not going to say anything super weird or anything like that. But uh, there are things that, so I have a 10-year-old. There are things I'm ready to talk with my 10-year-old about, and there are things I'm not ready to talk with my 10-year-old about. So use your own discretion about what to do with younger kids. I'm predicting in my house the conversation is going to go with my 10-year-old, something like this. Hey, buddy, um, we're going to have you not sit in the worship gathering this month, and he's going to say, oh, but Father, your preaching is the favorite part of my whole week. <laughs> what, what will I do? I'll be so bored with those other kids having fun. Uh, and I'll say, son, I'm your father. You need to obey me. And he'll say, I'm not, this is what he'll say, I'm not a kid anymore, Dad. I can handle it. And he, <clears throat> so if you see him here, he won, is what, is what it happened. But, so every family work it out. Every family work it out the way you want to work it out, and uh, we'll see what happens, okay? Uh, hey, please pray for the whole church, too. Summer is right around the corner. We have so many cool things going on. If you have a kid, so our, our interns arrived on Friday. Our inter are they in the room, per chance, or are they out eating? <laughs> They're out eating. Interns, okay. <clears throat> Our interns are here. If you have a kid that's worried about being bored this summer, the ref, our youth group is actually meeting twice every week. So middle school gets together for a Bible study one day, and then they just have fun, play volleyball and kickball the other day. High school gets together for a Bible study the next day. They have fun and just hang out and play volleyball. I mean, there's so much going on. If you have a kid that's bored, it is their fault. Okay, it's not on us. So we grab one of these. This is our uh, summer Next Generation Calendar, you can grab a copy of this in the information booth today. Just a lot of really cool stuff. A bunch of kids wanting to get baptized at the end of July. We got a group going to Juarez, Mexico to build houses this summer. If you are a university student, okay, between the ages of 18 and 24, any, anybody between 18 and 24? Okay, I don't have all the details. There's gobs of you around this summer. I don't have all the details. I know something is happening for you. Again, if you are bored, it's on you, man. It's not our fault, okay? I 
talk to Nate Stream. He, you're the first one I saw. Just ask him what's going on. If he doesn't know, just make it up, man. It'll be fine, okay? <laughs> There's a bunch of you who find each other. I heard they're like getting caribou's opening, like they're staying open late or something, so our guys, anyway, make it happen, okay? With all of that, uh, let's finally turn to the book of Hebrews for the last time until July. We're coming back, but let's turn to Hebrews together. This is a New Testament book. You'll find it on page 1004 uh, in a Bible under the chairs in front of you this morning. Just in case you're visiting today, we always have folks who are here for the first time. The book of Hebrews was written to a Jewish Christian audience who are being drawn away from Jesus back to Judaism, partly because Judaism had priests and vestments and sacrifices. The temple was still standing at the time this letter was written. So there was a lot there that was attractive. And the author of Hebrews, we're jumping right into the middle of a thought today, okay? The author of Hebrews has been drawing a contrast between the, the, you know, the priests of the old system, an external religion, and Jesus whose priesthood is far, far greater and comes from a totally different uh, angle. And here in chapter 7, he's been making the case Jesus is just a greater priest than the, the priests of Israel. So Hebrews chapter 7, uh, verse 23. Are you there? All right, here we go. It'll be on the screens too. The former priests were many in number because they were prevented by death from continuing in office. But Jesus holds his priesthood permanently because he continues forever. Consequently, he is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him since he always lives to make intercession for them. For it was indeed fitting that we should have such a high priest, holy, innocent, unstained, separated from sinners and exalted above the heavens. He has no need like those high priests to offer sacrifices daily, for first for his own sins and then for those of the people, since he did this once for all when he offered up himself. For the law appoints men in their weakness as high priests, but the word of the oath, which came later than the law, appoints a son who has been made perfect forever. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. That phrase right there at the end, verse 28, that phrase, the word of the oath, which came later than the law. Just a reminder, if you were here last week, he's talking about an oath that God made a thousand years before Jesus was born in Psalm 110, that the Messiah would be an eternal royal priest. So just a reminder, even if you haven't been here in a while, this thing of, of Jesus being the great high priest did not come out of nowhere. It was not invented in the New Testament. This is what God had said was going to happen. Uh, so, the heart of our reading today, and, and where we're going to spend basically all of our time, is actually verse 25. So, let me read verse 25 again. He says, Consequently, Jesus is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. So, the author of Hebrews assumes that all of us are trying to draw near to God through priests. And right away, we're into the problem of reading Hebrews as modern people. In the ancient world, there were temples and priests and sacrifice on every street corner practically, so this needed no explaining, but that is not how things are anymore. So here's a way in to this scripture reading for modern people, okay? In verse 25, the author uses the word intercession. Do you all see that there? Jesus always lives to make intercession for his people. Now we've talked this spring about how priests act as mediators between God and people. A good priest can deal gently with you because he's one of us and he, he gets it. So he can put his arm around you and say, it's all right, I'm right here uh, and I'm for you. Well, the other thing that priests do is speak to God for you, and that's called intercession. But the key to understanding this, the key to seeing this clearly, is that this word intercession actually has a legal connotation to it. We think mostly of prayer 
when we hear the word intercession, but it's actually a legal word. And so what verse 25 is talking about is that Jesus is an advocate who represents you in the courts of the Lord, in the courts of God. We've actually sung about it this morning. We, we read Psalm 90 or 99, 99, I think, this morning that describes the holiness of God's presence and the angels, and you don't just waltz in there. Nobody gets to just wander into the courts of God. He's a king. You need an advocate. You need an intercessor. Uh, the, the closest analogy that we would have in our context is you need a lawyer, okay, who kind of knows his stuff, who knows the court, who understands how it works and is not going to go in there and get you hung, okay? That's his job. Another way into this word, intercession, is to understand that everyone is looking for a verdict in their lives. You are. We may not be familiar with priests and temples and sacrifices, but we do know what it's like to be looking for validation or for a verdict. Am I a good person? Am I a good mom? Am I a good dad? Am I a moral person? Am I immoral? Uh, am I worthy of love? Am I worthy of honor? And so on. If you don't believe me, by the way, ask a therapist sometime. Ask a therapist, are modern people looking for validation? And the answer, unless they're crazy, will be yes. Modern people are looking for a verdict. We think uh, of religion as a relic from a dark and distant past. The fact is that ancient people were just more honest about what they wanted. They wanted to know that they were okay, that the gods were pleased with them, and that they would be blessed. We're exactly the same, except we want to be rid of the gods, and we want a verdict that comes from within ourselves. And again, it is not working. I would bet if you sat down with most therapists, they would tell you, modern people are living their lives as though it is one long trial. We are constantly trying to prove ourselves. We're, we're, we're looking for a sense that we're okay. So everybody, you can get rid of God. You cannot stop the trial. It is still going on. And you can, this is, you know, this is what we do. You can stand in front of the mirror every day and tell yourself, I am good looking. I am funny. And darn it, people like me. Sooner or later, your heart is going to say to you, and who are you? Why should I care what you think? So the Bible says that whether your mind will admit it or not, there is a God and your life is a trial. And deep down, you are looking for a verdict from the King of Heaven. Beneath all of our efforts to hear from other people that we're okay, or to tell ourselves that we're okay, we are looking for a verdict. Again, if you, if you don't believe me, look at social media. Our whole lives are, are a trial. So there is a God. You are on trial. The only question is, are you going to come into his courts by yourself or with an advocate who knows what he's doing? And Hebrews is saying, you don't have to go alone. You have a priest who lives to make intercession for us. Now, notice verse 25 again. It says, Jesus is able to save to the other, uttermost those who draw near to God through him. Okay, it doesn't say with him. You don't come into the court with Jesus. You come through him. Now, I've never been in the courts of a king, but I have sat in on a few of our courtrooms while they were in session. And here's one of the things you'll notice in a courtroom, and this would be true in the courts of a king as well. What you'll notice is that the people involved in the case never actually do anything. Have you ever noticed that? They don't say anything. They're not supposed to get up. They don't talk to the judge unless they're spoken to. All of the interaction is with the lawyers and the judge. That's, this is one thing that TV basically gets right. Uh, in court, 
It is your lawyer's performance that matters the most. So if they look competent and brilliant, you look competent and brilliant. And if they are just terrible, you're going to die. That's what's going to happen. You know what I mean? You're not getting off. And that's the role of an intercessor. If an, inter if an intercessor wins, you win. If they lose, you lose. Either way, everything your intercessor does, it comes to you. You're the beneficiary. So, this is one of the most important things I'm going to say this morning. Is everybody awake and is your teenager awake? Are you? Are you? Okay, even if you're, especially if you're visiting this morning, this is the most important thing I'm going to say, okay? Most, or I don't know, I don't know, I'm not going to say most, many people believe that what, what Christianity is, is Jesus is my teacher or my example. He, I, being a Christian means I'm going to keep the commandments, I'm going to read my Bible, I'm going to love people the way that Jesus did, I'm going to go to church more, I'm going to follow Jesus' example. And I just, I have to say to you, that is religion. That's you going into the courts of God with your resume in hand, saying, look, I've been a good Christian. I've, I've, that's you being your own intercessor. And it's not going to go well. To be a Christian is to be in Christ. The Bible says this a hundred times at least, over and over again. To be a Christian is to be in Christ, to be joined to him by faith. One of my favorite verses, Colossians 3.3, my life is hidden with God in Christ. To be a Christian is to have Jesus as your substitute, as your advocate and your intercessor. Jesus is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him, not with him. For a Christian, it's his intercession that is our hope. It's our only hope. When I was growing up, so here's where the analogy of the courtroom begins to break down. And don't email me about this, okay? This is just the only thing that came to my mind this week. When I was growing up, my entire introduction to the American legal system came through the trial of O.J. Simpson, okay? Does anyone remember the trial of O.J. Simpson? Okay, for like, for like t every evening for two months back in the 90s, on the evening news, which was a thing back then, uh, we were treated to these images of a courtroom somewhere in California with this weary-looking, haggard, harassed judge leading what appeared to be a, a legal circus, if you remember this. And then what I remember about the lawyers, at least the way they were presented through the media, was it was theater. It was legal trickery. And again, um, I'm, <laughs> this is just the way I remember it. It seemed like the whole country had decided he was guilty. And somehow they got him off. They got him free. And that's, that, when I think of a courtroom, that is my whole understanding. So when I hear that Jesus is my intercessor, you know, immediately my mind goes to, oh, I'm guilty. So he goes in there and does his thing, and somehow I get off. Yay! You know? And there's, so Tim, Tim Keller uses this great illustration. He says, you know, we have this, when we hear that Jesus is our intercessor, we have in our minds, you know, God the Father on the bench of the universe, he's looking very weary, very harassed, and every day Jesus comes in there and pulls out his case files for the day, you know. Who have we got today? It's a manila file folder. Oh, it's Tim Prince again, you know. <laughs> It's, it's Prince again, Father. You know all about his history. You know what he's done, all his promises to change, his good intentions, but he's doing it again. But please have mercy on him. You know, just take it easy on him. I, I know he means well, and, and you, you owe me. You remember, I did that whole thing. I went down under the earth for a while and this whole deal, and, and so please, just please have mercy and let him off one more time. And the father says, oh, all right. I'll let him go again. Well, when the Bible talks about the intercessory work of Jesus, 
It is not like that at all. That is not what is happening. Jesus is not a well-meaning, poorly dressed, harried public defender pleading with a recalcitrant God to get you off. Jesus is an enthroned priest king. He is the perfect son of God and everything that happens in redemption, he does with the father whose joy is to give the son all that he asks for. And he comes by means of his own blood shed on the cross. In other words, your intercessor comes with an infallible case before the Father. Verse 26, this, look at verses 26 and 27. So this adds to the courtroom picture. It says, For it was indeed fitting that we should have such a high priest, holy, innocent, unstained, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens. He has no need, like other priests, to offer sacrifices day after day, first for his own sins and then for those of the people. He did this once for all when he offered himself. Surveys tell us that many Christians believe that Jesus sinned just like the rest of us. But to be clear, that, that cannot be the case. It would not be fitting Okay, he could not intercede for you if he were just like us in all these ways. But he's holy, unstained, innocent, exalted above the heavens. So unlike the make-believe scene, you know, that I just painted for you, when Jesus intercedes, he's, he comes into the Father's presence and he says, Father, you demand justice and you are holy and righteous and just. And Prince is guilty but I have paid for this. Look at my blood, and it would be unjust for you to punish this again. And so I come today insisting that you keep your word and that you give justice in this case. Jesus does not intercede for you asking for mercy. He comes asking for God's justice. His, God's very nature, his righteousness demands that if you draw near through the blood of Jesus, you are welcomed. John, 1 John chapter 1, verses 8 through 9, says if we confess our sins, God is faithful and what? Just. Not faithful and merciful. God is faithful and just to forgive our sins. So Jesus does not need to cajole. He doesn't need legal trickery. He's not manipulating the jury. He comes on the basis of an indestructible and perfect life laid down in love for the salvation of sinners. And the Father loves to give the Son all that he asks. Are you trusting in Jesus Christ alone for the forgiveness of your sin and the hope of eternal life? If you are, then he invites you to draw near to the throne of grace with confidence. So, you know, every day we're hustling around trying to earn some verdict on our lives. Jesus saves to the uttermost those who draw near through him. Now this phrase, the uttermost, this is my favorite thing in all we've read today. So that was the most important thing. This is my favorite thing. He saves to the uttermost. There are these long, boring sections in Exodus, chapters 25 through 30, where Bible reading plans go to die. You know, you're cruising along, interesting story, interesting story, and then it's... It describes in detail the instructions Moses was given for how to build the tabernacle, how to create the utensils for sacrifice, how to dress the high priest, how to do the sacrifices, etc., etc. And what's interesting, though, if you read those boring chapters this week, is that over and over what God says to Moses is, do this and build this and make this in the way that I've shown you. 
build the tabernacle, make the utensils, dress the high priest after the pattern that I've shown you. So Moses isn't just given a set of instructions. Moses saw something. He was allowed to see something. that In the next chapter of Hebrews, which we'll get to in July, we're going to talk more about this. But what Moses built was actually an imitation of something he was allowed to see. And one of the things you notice about the high priest is that he was just covered in gold and silver and precious stones and dressed in linen. He was dazzling. I mean, he was radiant. He, he, basically, he wore around on his body the GDP of the nation, practically. All of the materials in the high priest's clothing are symbolic of something real, and so it's hard, it's hard to know. What exactly did Moses see? And are, are the, is the clothing of the priest, is it all just symbol, which I think is probably the case, or did he literally see a priest in linen and all, all these other things? But most moving for me, personally, is that the high priest wore the names of his people on his chest and his shoulders. So across the priest's chest and on his shoulders were these precious stones, rubies and emeralds and topaz and diamond and things like that, and each one was engraved with the names of God's people. And the priest wore this around the tabernacle. The, the, the point there, what, what all that is pointing forward to is that your intercessor wears your name over his heart and on his shoulders. And in the presence of the Father, he is radiant. And, and somehow, it, it's, you know, it's almost unimaginable, but somehow we add to the, I don't even, okay, I don't even know, I don't know how this can be true, so you just go home and think about this. Somehow the redemption of God's people adds to the luster of the Son in the presence of the Father. Somehow in taking up your life, all that you've done, all of your history, your story, in taking it up and redeeming it and making you beautiful before the Father, Your redemption adds to his majesty, his glory in the presence of the Father. That's what the boring chapters in Exodus are about. If being a Christian were just a matter of being forgiven and not being punished for sin, okay, that would be awesome. But he saves to the uttermost. He doesn't just forgive, but he sh- we share in his untouchable, matchless righteousness. Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones, in light of this, he, he, Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones used to give this test to people, and I'm going to administer this test to you right now. Don't answer out loud, please. But he says, when I've explained the way of Christ to somebody, I say, now are you ready to say that you're a Christian? I'm going to ask you that in a minute, by the way. Are you ready to say that you're a Christian? And when they hesitate, I say, what's the matter? Why are you hesitating? And so often people say, well, I'm not sure I'm good enough yet. I don't know that I'm ready to become a Christian now. Once I hear that, he says, I know that they're still thinking in terms of themselves. They have to do it. It sounds very modest to say, I don't think I'm good enough, but it is a denial of the faith. The very essence of the Christian faith is to say that Jesus is good enough and I am in him. As long as you go on thinking about yourself like that and saying, I'm not good enough, I'm not good enough, you are denying God, you are denying the gospel, you are denying the essence of the faith and you will never be happy. How can I put it plainly, he says. It doesn't matter if you have the most, it doesn't matter if you have almost entered into the depths of hell. It doesn't matter if you're guilty of murder as well as every other vile sin. It does not matter from the standpoint of being justified before God. You are no more hopeless than the most moral and respectable person in the world because you have a high priest who lives to make intercession for you. Jesus saves to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him. 
Do you, do you see that? Can you see yourself in the sun as he stands in the courts of the living God with your name on his chest? And the Father loves to give him everything he asks for. Why would this matter? Why should it matter? I'm just going to share. These are, I'm borrowing these from Tim Keller. I'll just share three things. There's more than this, but number one, every single person here is on trial. You know that. Everyone feels that. Your heart feels that. Whether you believe in God or not this morning, we are chasing a verdict and you are either going to grab hold of Jesus Christ by faith or you're going to grab hold of something else to make the case that you're good, beautiful, worthy, and, and so on. The trouble is, if you grab hold of something else, sometimes you're doing well and sometimes you're doing not. You're, you're not doing well. And so you're either going to have to stand in front of the mirror and lie to yourself every day and you'll know that you're lying or you're going to be dependent on the verdict of other people. Now, if you're really lucky, maybe you have some people in your life who love you through thick and thin, but they, don't re they do not really know you. They can't really know the deepest, darkest parts of your heart. Praise God. But God does. Only God can say with, to you, I know you perfectly and I am prepared to set my love on you. If the Son of God is your priest and you are drawing near to God through him, if your name is written on his, on his heart, if you know that he has taken up everything about you, He's taken up your whole history and redeemed it and somehow that redemption adds to his, his glory before the Father. What an identity. I mean, what a life-shaping, stable, immovable identity to walk through the world with. And if that's true then, all of the other little verdicts in your life, they just don't matter that much. Okay, that's the second thing. If this is true, if you, can, if you could see this, it would be the end of, of guilt. Okay, I had this, this really, really interesting thing happen this week. Uh, I, I have to make it brief and I have to keep it vague, but I could not give you a better illustration of what I'm talking about than this. You know the best thing about living in Hudson, Wisconsin? Does anyone know? It's that no one here knew me 25 years ago. And almost no one knew me 20 years ago in college. That is the best part about living here. Does anyone else enjoy that? <laughs> this week on Monday, something happened, which will remain vague because we're on the interwebs right now. Something happened where my previous life invaded this life. Uh, where it, it, became, it became a real possibility that two people who really knew me in high school might move here and worship here at this church. And I, I'm gonna tell you, it put me in a tizzy, uh, a tailspin. And I'll just, I'm trying to keep it brief, but uh, when I'm in a tailspin, I can hide it from everybody except my wife. And so that evening we sit down to pray together and she says, what is your deal today? You are not here, you are somewhere else. And long story short, I just had to say, Darcy, the best thing about being here, I was not at my best in high school. Not at my best, maybe, and much better in college, still not at my best. And this is the conversation I had today. And I said, I am so deeply ashamed of who I was. I never have to think about that here. You don't know me. But to have these two people, they, they know me better than my brothers did. To have them worship here, I don't think I'm gonna do well. I'm just so profoundly ashamed of what I was like. Next day I get up and I study for the sermon I just presented to you. And I just have to tell you, I cannot give you a better remedy for shame and guilt than the scripture we just read here. Jesus lives to make intercession for his people. 
your name is written across his heart. And when you see that, when it becomes real to your heart, can you say, when, you're, when your history comes to, does anyone else have these moments where suddenly a slideshow pops in your head of all the awful things you've done and a little voice begins to say, you're a liar and a cheat and a manipulator and a murderer and blah, 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 blah. Can your heart say, I know. But before the throne of God above, I have a strong and perfect plea. A great high priest whose name is love, whoever lives to plead for me. My name is written on his hands. My name is written on his heart. And I know that while in heaven he stands, no one can bid me depart, even my friends from high school. Can you say that? Last thing then. If this became real to our hearts, we would experience tremendous courage with grace. And this is a transition actually kind of into next week uh, where we begin talking about sexual identity and gender identity and things like that. In Acts chapter 7, there's this really great story about a man named Stephen, the first Christian martyr who was brought to trial by the religious authorities for teaching about Jesus and so naturally he taught about Jesus at his trial and it says they were so enraged at what he said that they dragged him out of the city and as they lined up to stone him it says that Stephen was filled with the Holy Spirit and allowed to see a vision of heaven just for a moment. And as they began to stone him, he called out in a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. There was such joy as he was being executed and such love that he was able to forgive them even as they stoned him to death. So the question is, what did he see in heaven? It says that he saw the glory of God and the Lord Jesus standing at the right hand of the Father. He saw his advocate, his, his intercessor. And so at the moment, the very moment when an earthly court was condemning him, Stephen saw the only court that actually matters. And he was filled with such joy that he was able to sincerely love the people putting him to death. Next week, we're going to begin this teaching series and one of the great challenges in front of the church, and this is, This is what we would ask you to pray for. One of the great challenges in front of the church is to tell the truth with clarity and courage and at the same time to do it without rage and vitriol and to join in the noise of the world. And I do do not think that can be done unless you can see the sun, unless you can see your priest. So God, help us. As we prepare to go to communion this morning, are you a Christian? Are you a Christian? Is there any hesitation in your answer this morning? Are you waiting to prove something or to be good enough or does your hope really rest with the Son of God alone and his blood shed on the cross for you? Can you see him robed in righteousness, radiant in glory before the Father with your name adding to that splendor? If you aren't, maybe today as you've been listening, you just, you just became aware for whatever reason. Wow, I've actually been religious this whole time. It is, today is always the right day to repent of your righteousness. And I invite you to do that now as we come to communion. If you're here and you know that you're not a Christian and you're still trying, because you're trying to sort things out, wouldn't you want this to be true? Wouldn't you want what you've heard today to be true? Let's pray before we go to the table together. Our Father in heaven, What a privilege to call you by that name through the Son, Jesus. Thank you for receiving us.
for Jesus' sake. And we come with all confidence and all humility, asking God that you would see us and hear us today. I ask God as we come to communion that, that you would make who the Son is real to our hearts. Help us to see. We ask together in Jesus' name. Everyone said, Amen. Why don't you take your elements here? On the night that Jesus was betrayed, it said that he took bread and he gave thanks and broke it, saying, this is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Let's share. All right, let's stand together and sing. <clears throat>